accidentally, I think Jacob accidentally said, well, I do love you as a brother in the Lord, but I think I called Jacob this week, or maybe it was last week about something, and I'm like, okay, love you, bye, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> but I, I can't help it, I, I have this habit, because my family is a very loving family, that we always say, I love you when you get off the phone. That's our way of saying goodbye. You might not hear us say goodbye because as soon as we say I love you, we, we, <laughs> we hang up real fast. But you know what? We always say I love you. But Ron Teal, when he came and spoke to us, sorry about that, Sylvia. It, it was a, a brotherly, sisterly love here. But <laughs> when Ron Teal came, Oh, so you didn't even hear it. Okay, so my confession's for nothing, guys. But <laughs> yeah, one time, yeah, you didn't even hear it. One time, and I'm really bad with emojis because I have fat thumbs. So one time I went, one of our board members, uh, Paul, um, and I went to send a smiley face emoji, and I accidentally sent a kissy face emoji. <laughs> Thankfully, I had him and his wife in a group text together, and she was cracking up laughing because she knew. I was like, oh, my God. That was the wrong emoji. So, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> you know what? But with God, we should say, I love you back because he loved us first. So it's, I love you too, God, because he already said it to us. I love you. You know, just insert your name. I love you, Jesse. I love you, Lisey. I love you, Santi. I love you, Frank. <laughs> I love you back, right? I love you back, God. I love you back. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. So today, this message, I'm going to speak this message, is uh, from the book of Acts, because we've been in this together since, like, the whole summer. I was like, you know what, I want to one-up PK uh, and, and preach the book of Acts for a very long time, but I don't think I can one-up him, because I think he did six months, and we're ending um, the book of Acts after this month, and we're going to do a sermon series in September. I'm giving you a preview called Are You Ready, and we're going to talk about end times and the rapture and just getting ready. I, I, we, we showed a little video that Shannon, who was my uh, pastor's wife, who raised me up in ministry and raised Josh up, her and PK, did a little video on the rapture, and we shared it with our youth and just had uh, a lot of kids ask questions. I had four teenagers get saved that day, and it wasn't like we're trying to scare you into uh, salvation. We're not uh, down with that, and we would, you know, but at the same time, we do all need to have a healthy fear of God. And what that is, is an awe and respect. Just like growing up, we should have a healthy respect for our parents. God is the parent of the world, if you will, right? He's the father to the followers. He's the father, you know, our father, which are in heaven. Isn't that how Jesus taught us to pray? Well, we need to have a healthy um, fear and respect. And we really see that in the book of Acts. I mean, you had people dropping dead because they lied about some money in the book of Acts. Speaking of money, um, we do receive an offering, but it'll be at the end of service. If you're tuning in online, you can go ahead and give through our website, www.vision.today. Just totally showed how old I am by saying those W's, but that's okay. God really did teach us the fear of the Lord, though, through his word. And we have to have a fear of the Lord. We have to have a respect and an awe for God because he is sovereign. He's all-knowing and all-powerful, and yet, even though he knows every little thing, about us. That's scary sometimes, right? Like even those thoughts that don't even come out of our mouth and the ones who do come out of our mouth, he knows those too. <laughs> and yet his grace covers us when we truly accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so today we are going to continue on with the book of Acts and I'm really excited. We're going towards the end of the book here and we're going to be a lot in Acts chapter 28, but I'm going to flip back and forth to like I think chapter 21 or 22 as well. Um, and the message today it's called what to do when things get worse. That sounds fun, right? Oh, you're going to be so encouraged today. I promise you're going to be so uplifted because I'm not going to be that kind of preacher that lies to you and say, come to Jesus. We're going to slide down rainbows. We're going to skip through lily patches. We're going to sing on top of clouds like Care Bears. That's the Care Bears, friends. That's not the Christian life. Man, come to Jesus and you're going to die daily. And you're going to have to learn to pick up your cross daily. But you're going to become more like him. And when you go through the trials and the testing and the storms, he's going to be with us. So what to do when things get worse? The, and, and then my title number two, if you will. Yeah, that's going to be good. We got two titles. Is S-O-S. I call it shaking off snakes. But S-O-S. <laughs> Woo, got to shake it off. SOS, the definition of SOS is a Morse code for a distress signal. 
So some people use it as an acronym for save our shit, but it's a, a Morse code for distress signal. And, and honestly, let's be real. Some of us have been in distress in this season. 2020, woo! Can we just say, woo! <laughs> some of us, <laughs> some of us have been thrown out those SOSs like, Jesus. Do you see me down here? <laughs> Let me send out a smoke signal. Come on. Hello, God. Right here, your girl. She needs you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Can, extra hallelujah. Extra hallelujah. Come on. So here we are, and we're going to learn how Paul the apostle, how he handled his SOS in Acts chapter 28. I'm going to read from the message translation. Now listen. I am one of those ministers who like to read from many translations because we can now. And so I grew up more uh, getting on fire and disciple in the 90s, and we always did the NIV, and I know the generation before me always did the KJV. And then I, the message is not a word-for-word -word translation. But sometimes we can become like Pharisees, and we want to every, uh, every I dot and every T cross that we, we were trying so hard to get the absolute meaning from the, from the Greek that we missed the overall meaning. And so every once in a while, I think it's good to go ahead to a paraphrase version, which is what the message is, to get the big picture. And so, okay, we're going to get the big picture here, but I do have some um, other translations that we're going to be reading from too. And listen, you can, if you got a smartphone, boom. If you don't like the message, click to another one. But here's the message, and I think it's pretty good. I think it breaks it down rather well in this part. So here's Paul. And, and uh, to get you where we're going, Paul um, just basically uh, was handed over to, uh, to the authorities, and he's on, he's got arrested, and he's on his way to Rome, and he's in a ship, and, and, a, a, and a wreck happens, a storm happens, and, and then we see what happens in, in chapter 28 here. It says, once everyone was accounted for, and we realized that we had all made it, right? His ship just wrecked, and, and <laughs> it, was, it was pretty scary. It says, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. Sounds like a shake. The natives went out of their way to be friendly to us. The day was rainy and cold, and we were already soaked to the bone. But they built a huge bonfire and gathered around us. Paul pitched in to help. Because you know what? He didn't say, I'm the apostle Paul, so let me sit back and all y'all go ahead and get the wood together. No, he pitched in to help because a true man or woman of God is going to serve. So he pitched in to help. He gathered and bundled up the sticks. Put, uh, but when, when he put them on the fire, a venomous snake rose from its uh, uh, torpor, torpor, whatever that word is, by the heat, struck his hand and held on. So the snake came jumping out the fire and held onto his hand. Can you imagine? I mean, the man already got arrested for, you know, being a good Christian. Uh, got put on a ship that had a shipwreck and had to swim to an island. And now he's still got good, good joy about him. And he's serving and he's putting the fire together. And here comes a snake out of the fire. And, and, and it was a venomous snake, the Bible says. And it, it, it held onto his hand. But what did Paul do? Paul shook the snake off into the fire. Let's just say that together. Paul shook the snake off into the fire. We need to shake off snakes, friends. None the worse for the weir. Nothing happened to him. They kept expecting him to drop dead. They were watching him like how I sometimes sit out on my porch and watch what's going on. <laughs> Come on, you guys remember when people used to sit on the front porch? Yeah, they were watching him. The islanders, they were watching like, ooh, you see that prisoner? And he just, he was helping. And that snake just, hmm, what's going to, they were watching. And, and it says they kept expecting him to drop dead. But when it was obvious he wasn't going to, they jumped to the conclusion that he was a god. <laughs> Gotta love the way people thought. And it says in verse 7 through 9, it says, The head man in the part of the island was Publius. He took us into his home as a guest, drying us out and putting us up in fine style for the next three days. Publius' father was sick at the time, down with a high fever and basically diarrhea. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> okay. It sounds kind of like worse than corona right there. Uh, Paul went to the old man's room, and when he laid his hands on him and prayed, the man was healed. How awesome, right? Word of the healing got around fast. You know they was already talking to him. I'm like, you see that man? He just got bit by his Hold up. He just healed the old guy over there. What's going on here? 
And soon everyone on the island who was sick came out to get healed. It's like a vaccination was made. You know what I mean? Like, come on, everybody. And so it says here in verse 10 through 11, we spent wonderful three months on Malta. Three months. They weren't even supposed to go there. It's because of a shipwreck. I'm going to preach about that in a minute. And they treated us royally, took care of our needs, and outfitted us for the rest of the journey. Come on now. That's nice. When an Egyptian ship that had wintered there and harbored prepared to leave for Italy, we got on the boat. The ship had carved Gemini for its figurehead and the, for the heavenly twins. That's just a little extra detail <laughs> for you that right there. Wow, who says the Bible is boring? They don't read it if they say that because there is so many interesting things that happen. So today we're going to talk about five things to do when things get worse. When things go from bad to worse. And we're going to do it my favorite style, an acrostic. Why not? Why not? We're going to break down that word worse as an acrostic. Come on, somebody. So the first thing that we need to do that we can learn from this account from the Apostle Paul of what to do when things go from bad to worse is, well, where you are, there you are. Oh. That's an old school saying. I'm about to teach some of you young people. You're a teenager in here? Yeah. Some of my teens are teaching me their slang. Let me teach you something that is good for you to know. Where you are, there you are. Oftentimes, we're thinking about where we want to be in Florida, on a beach, in a multi-million dollar house. <laughs> We think about where we want to be, but sometimes when we're always thinking about where we want to be, we forget where God has us right now, and where you are, there you are. My good friend, Laura Rowe, taught me this early on. Joy, wherever you are, work at it with all your heart. If that's your, if that's your assignment, do it with everything you have. Where you are, there you are. So we're going to back up just a little bit and recap. Again, I started telling some of this, but Paul, listen, he was the greatest apostle who ever lived. Before his conversion, he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. Uh, he, was, uh, he persecuted the church. We, we, we learned about this a few weeks ago. However, after he gave his heart to the Lord, he had a great ministry. I mean, whole villages and towns like Malta came to the Lord because of his ministry. He, even in prison, when he was persecuted for Christ, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament because he understood where he was there he was. Now, the reason Paul was on a ship in the first place is because he was arrested in Jerusalem on his way to Rome to appeal to Caesar. Talk about what to do when things go from bad to worse. I mean, something that Paul always did that many of us don't understand today is he understood his assignment. Where he was, there he was. See, Paul started, the Bible says that he, would, he, he's, he felt the Holy Spirit actually lead him to Jerusalem. Now, check this out, friends. Um, in chapter 21 of the book of Acts, if you have your Bible and you want to flip back or maybe your smartphone and you want to look back, I can't read it all. But it, it was a very interesting scene took place. It was a New Testament first century, century prayer service. Now, us being Pentecostal believers, we've experienced some prayer services. And although my message is called shaking off snakes, we have never passed snakes around. I can say that. That's not the type of Pentecostals we are. But we have experienced some awesome, incredible prayer services. But I would have loved to just be like a fly in the corner in this prayer service. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to see it on the big screen in heaven, what exactly all the details of went, what went down. Because it was pretty wild in Acts chapter 21. So they're in a prayer service. I believe it was the church of Ephesians. The Ephesian believers were gathered around Paul and they were warning him because the Holy Spirit showed them that if you go to Jeru Jerusalem, you are going to be handed over to the authorities and you're going to be arrested. Now, some of us would have been like, that's God's word. I guess I'm going back a different direction and we'll go to Jerusalem later. But Paul says in verse 20 or chapter 21, verse 13, then Paul, well, hold up. I got to tell you one more funny thing before I read that verse. So this church service, this prayer service got a little wild and there was a prophet named Agabus. This is in the scripture. Go back and read it. He literally took the belt off of his pants and wrap them around Paul's hands and prophesy. If you, just in case he didn't get it. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and you're going to be arrested. I mean, talk about an object lesson. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
He, he made it very clear. So this did not go over anyone's head in there. Everybody got the picture. You know what I'm saying? And yet Paul still says this in chapter 21, verse 13. It says, then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Where you are, there you are. He knew his assignment. He knew his assignment. He could have took that word of God as an escape route. Let me go over here. But instead, he knew his assignment. Yes, the word, the prophetic word was true. That did happen. He was arrested. He was bound. But yet, Paul knew that he was supposed to go. This is the thing. When things go from bad to worse, we as Americans, Pastor Josh hit this so good last week. If you didn't listen to the message, go back and listen to it. He said our philosophy as Americans is to say, oh, well, if something doesn't work out for you, God has something better for you. But God is sovereign, friends, and sometimes things go from bad to worse. Sometimes it's like what is happening, and he allows us to go through hardships. I know people don't like to say amen to that because, let's be real, I like it soft and cozy. I like cuddles and, and rainbows and, and, and sunshine and beaches. I mean, who doesn't? And shopping? I got this shirt for $10, y'all. Come on, God is good. <laughs> I got you, boo. But listen, sometimes we go through bad days, bad years, bad seasons, and we need to be prepared to be filled with the Holy Spirit that we can do what God has called us to do. And even when the word comes, listen, even when the, the word comes and it's, it's going to get worse, we are prepared because we have heard from God, this is what we are supposed to do. We know our assignment. We know our assignment. Paul understood his assignment. We have different assignments for different seasons. Right now, part of my assignment is raising Shua, Jubilee, Jordan, and Justice. Sometimes it feels like I'm skipping through lily pads, and sometimes it feels like I'm through the tribulations. <laughs> but that's part of my assignment, and I take it serious. Part of my assignment is to help steward the gifts of God that are in, within you here at our Waterville campus, to, to help create an environment and an atmosphere that we can worship freely. That's part of my assignment, and I know it, and I take it seriously. Friends, what is part of your assignment right now? What has God called you to do? It's not going to always be easy. But when you know it, you can do it with your whole heart. And when things get hard, it helps when you know that you are exactly where you are supposed to be. So here Paul is, where he is, there he is, just like us. That's where we're at, right here on 1740. Now word, get your now word, road. God is doing something in your life, and he is not through with you. And so if we want to understand what to do when things get, go from bad to worse, we need to know where we're at. But you know what? We also need to learn to turn opposition into opportunity. I feel like every time I preach, the word opposition comes up, but, you know, that's cool. <laughs> because the more we grow in the Lord, the more opposition comes against us. It just is what it is. When, when the storm sent the gospel through Paul to an island he very likely would have never went to, if the storm didn't happen, that was him turning opposition into opportunity. Come on, somebody get that. This is the thing, people, friends. This is the thing. Sometimes the storms in your life, the times you feel like you've been shipwrecked, you know what I'm saying? Those kind of storms. Sometimes those kind of storms have the greatest ministry that comes out. Come on, somebody. We don't like it, but the greatest ministry comes out of that. One of my mother-in-law's greatest storms she ever went through is when she went through a divorce after 18 years of trying with four children. But because of that storm and that shipwreck, her son, she got saved, and then her son got saved. It might not have happened otherwise. And, and I know that's like, oh, that messes our theology up. But listen, friends, it's from those places of storms. It's from those places of where you feel like you're a shipwreck, where everything just gets destroyed in your life, that God wants to use you from and minister in you and through you. The hardest things in your life sometimes are the biggest blessings in disguise. <laughs> biggest blessings in disguise. Oh. Jesus. Sometimes storms will bring us into new territory. 
you found yourself in a storm, found yourself having problems at home, problems in school or not school or never going back to school, <laughs> fighting with loved ones, feeling lonely and empty inside, feeling depressed, fear <laughs> like never before, anxiety like never before, failure, maybe you're out of work, maybe you don't know what the future holds, not that any of us do, but you just have so much uncertainty right now and you have so much going on. Friends, I want to encourage you. God may have an island of Malta for you. You just got to get through this. Just keep swimming. I believe the prophet Dora said that. <laughs> Am I getting funnier? Because I kind of feel like I'm getting funnier. Okay, sorry. I, I laugh at my own jokes. It's a weakness. <laughs> ah! Listen, friends, we got to keep on going. Do you know patience and endurance? You know what that actually means in the Greek? I'm about to get smart on y'all. It means hang in their power. <laughs> we got to keep going. And when we do, we find ourselves after all that storm and rain, and we find ourselves in a season of refreshing that island of Amalta. Hallelujah. Who doesn't like an island? Mm, Jamaica, I'm coming back to you soon. <laughs> The prisoners and the soldiers are cold. So what does Paul do? Well, he begins to gather wood and a fire. Ephesians 5, 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Sometimes in order for us to get our breakthrough, I don't know if he would have had. He, actually, I believe that he would not have had the breakthrough on the island of Malta if he didn't first serve. He didn't go there first saying, where's the pulpit that I'm going to preach? He said, no, where's the wood at so I can build a fire? Because these prisoners that were on the boat with me, when you actually go back and read earlier on in that chapter, Paul was already reading, already leading people. So much so that the captain of the ship came over and asked Paul what to do. He's in handcuffs. He's in prison. And yet, he was the leader. And true leaders serve. So what, did, what was the first thing he did when he got to that? He thought, how can I serve? Oh, man, they're cold. They're wet. Let me, let me go. Let me jump up and get some wood. Let me put it together. And from that place, he got bit by that snake. <laughs> and yet he, he shook that snake off, and then they saw him in a different light. And sometimes it's, we receive the, the healing and the faith and the miracles when we see people as God sees them. The Bible even says if you want to receive a pro prophet's reward, then you need to receive a prophet as a prophet, right? And so they received him as a man of God, and they received from him the prophetic ministry, the healing ministry that God had in him. And he took advantage of every opportunity to serve. Sometimes our breakthrough doesn't happen until we just say, you know what, I'm going to serve. It's not going to be about me today. How can I minister to you? So opposition turned into opportunity. That's what we do when things go from bad to worse. Another thing that we do when things get worse, well, it's um, we remain faithful. We remain faithful. We do not give up. So Paul's serving, and he, you know, he gets bit by that snake, and things go bad to worse again, and people are like, hey, hey, what's going to happen to you? And yet Paul did, it didn't say that he, sh uh, you know, that he was fearful, that he shrunk back in fear. I mean, let's be real. If I got bit by, first of all, if I just saw a snake, I would probably be freaking out, even a gardener snake. I was doing a little prayer walk in my backyard, and I've never in my entire, how many years, 16 years of living in my house, saw a snake in my backyard. There's a little garden snake, not poisonous. I used to catch them when I was little, but that startled me. I can't imagine if you had one of those big old snakes that were venomous jumping out, but yet Paul knew what the scripture says. He knew what, what Jesus said himself in Mark 16. It says, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not harm them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. He had faith shook that snake off and said, my assignment's not done yet. God sent me to Rome, and he knew where he was supposed to go. And friends, I want to encourage you, when things get hard and the enemy is coming after you and he is sending one bad thing after another, stay faithful. Remain faithful. Do not give up. Do not lose heart. And when you do feel just a little under, 
Keep on going back to God. He will help you get through. When people wrongly judge you, because what, what happened before the ironers praised him? They were like, oh, snap, he's about to drop dead. He must be a criminal. If you read other translations, they're like, he must have done some really bad stuff. Because not only was he, sh- you know, shipwrecked and in a storm, but now the snakes are biting him. He must have done some really bad stuff. Have you ever been falsely accused? I have. Have you ever had anyone talk about you behind your back? Have you ever talked about anyone before you judge those people so much? Oh, Lord. <laughs> come on. Come on. Right? Have we even spoken things over our own husband that's not true, or our own wife that isn't true, or our own children? Sometimes we're, we wonder why people are acting that way, but we're cursing them how, with our own mouth. Right? And so here, here Paul is, and, and, and people are cursing, at, cursing him and saying, oh, he, he's evil, and he's this, and he's that. But instead of letting those words go into his soul and define him, No, he shook that snake off, and he remained faithful. Paul was not swayed by man's opinion. Preaching to myself now. Come on, somebody. He was not swayed by man's opinion. Is that that's hard in our social media generation? Hello, I only got like one like on one of my awesome, most awesome posts. What is going on, people? Right? And then we start thinking, like, do they not see the anointing? (laughs) <laughs> like for real, we are, it's, it's hard not to get swayed by man's opinion. It really is. Some of you older people are like, oh, I don't, I don't care. We ain't there yet. <laughs> we ain't there yet. We're getting there. We're getting there. But sometimes it's hard to remain faithful. Sometimes it's hard to remain faithful when someone is saying mean things about us. But we have to remain faithful nonetheless. And part of the way we do that is we know that no man on this earth, no person, no human being on this earth defines us. Only God defines us. I'm going to say it one more time for the teenagers in the back. Only God defines us. Not one man, not one person, not one human being defines us. Let that sink down into your soul. Not one human being can define you. Only God defines you. And you are made in his image, and you're going to do great and mighty things for him if you continue to surrender your life to him and worship him. So here's Paul's opinion on on, on that, on on men, and and why he could remain faithful. Galatians 1.10, he says, "And, and am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people or God? Am I trying to please people or God? I want to please God. I want to please God. I want to remain faithful. That's how we please him. Because, see, we all want to get super on fire for God in the beginning and, and have that fire. But the Bible says he who remains faithful to the end shall be saved. It's so easy in kids' church when you first feel the anointing of God to be faithful. But it's through growing up, through teenage years, through peer pressure, through becoming a young adult, through more peer pressure, trying to figure out your career, who you're going to marry, how you're going to have children, where you're going to live. It's it's those things, everyday life, that's harder that you have to still remain faithful to the very end, to the very end. I want to encourage some of you, don't give up. Don't give up. Finally, if you want to remain faithful, you want to know how to handle things when it goes from bad to worse, well, then I've been saying it the whole time. It's my part two sermon title, Shake Off Snakes. Shake Off Snakes. So Paul got bit by a snake, and you know what he did? He shook it off. You remember that popular Taylor Swift song? Maybe you don't. Maybe you're like me. You really don't even listen to secular music. Oh, mom, you're about to get down to it. Shake it off. Even Vicky listens to T-Swift. Okay. Okay, I just totally embarrassed my teenagers. But this is basically one of the only ones uh, that I occasionally will listen to because I'm telling you, her song, I know it's like way old and my kids are like, oh, my gosh, mom, seriously, that's so 2012. Um, But listen, (laughs) it's probably like, was it 2014? Oh, okay. So I'm not that old. Okay. So cause the, I'm about to quote to you what T-Swift says. Because the player's going to play, play, play. And the haters going to hate, hate, hate. But baby, I'm going to shake, 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 shake it off. 
shake it off. I'm telling you, sometimes we've got to shake it off. We got to shake it off. We got to shake off those negative words spoken over us. We got to shake off sin that so easily entangles us. It entangles us. And we got to shake off that sin because sometimes it's our own flesh nature that just wants to do it, just wants to tell someone about themselves because they deserve it. (laughs) The poor McDonald's lady almost got it today. I can't remember what she said to me. Oh, I turned around to hand like five drinks to my children in the back, one who was hiding in the trunk. Don't judge. And um, she was like, I'm here with the bag. I'm like, "Um, excuse me, can you wait a moment? But at least that's all I said. I had some other things I had to take captive. <laughs> we got to shake it off. We got to shake it off because our flesh, listen, y'all, this is 22-something years serving the Lord, and my flesh still wants to rise up. It wants to <laughs> rise up. But we got to shake off those sins. So, listen, snakes symbolically represent enemies of God. They do all throughout the Scripture. I mean, you all do remember the Garden of Eden, Right? Who was the, who was the, sur- there was a serpent right there trying to tempt Eve. Did God really say that? You know, t- that's how temptation always starts, making you doubt God, just so you know, young people. That's the, temp- it's from the beginning. He spoke, did God really say that? We got to be careful not to question the word of God. That's what snakes want us to do. Come on, somebody. So, so snakes represent demonic en- enemies that are sent from the evil one. They could represent flesh inside of us. Offense, that's a snake. We got to shake it off. Oh, it's so easy to get offended. Oh, my gosh. We're all so moody these days, especially in tw- I purposely try to be extra happy when I go shopping because these poor, well, first of all, it's kind of easy for me to be happy when I'm shopping. But I actually was talking to one lady because I'm super chatty, and I was sitting there talking to one lady when I was, <laughs> when I was shopping, and I, and I had my little mask on, and we're, like, talking through our mask, having a hard time hearing each other, but being, I was, like, smiling with my eyes, you know what I mean? And I'm talking, <laughs> yeah, you got to smile with your eyes. And so I was talking to this lady, and, and, and she was, like, telling me, like, how people are so mean, and I was, like, really? Even when they're shopping and they got like a 35% off? She's like, yes. I was like, I don't know how anyone could be in a bad mood when they're shopping, but I'm sorry. And I just encouraged her and went on about my business. But listen, friends, people are, people are moody right now because it's 2020. And so we got to shake off a fence. We got to shake off a fence. We got to shake off anger and rage. Lord, Jesus, all this passion I, I got I to submit to God and, and shake off that rage that wants to get me. Negative thinking, oh, all of our insecurities, looking at the Pinterest models. It's so hard, young people. It's so hard. But you got to shake it off because God made you who you are. And you know what? Boys deal with it too. They do. And we got to shake it off. The gossip, the slander, the complaining, the lies, the lust, the rebellion, the disobedience. Woo! Shake it off. Shake it off. We need to shake these things off just like Paul did with that snake, and we need to throw it back to the pit of hell where it came from. You know, there was a time that I, that I would say, I rebuke you, devil, right out loud. I would say, shut up, devil. <laughs> Early on in my walk, there's the only way I knew how to do it. I, was, I still talk to myself uh, all the time. I'm a very verbal person, in case you can't tell. And so out loud, I had to say, I rebuke you. I I rebuke you thoughts of lust. I rebuke you anger. I rebuke you rage out loud. And sometimes I still do to take authority over that thing. Because there's power in our words agreeing with what the word of God agrees with. Friends, God is speaking to us that it is time to shake off snakes and put them in the fire where they belong. It's time for, for us as men and women of God to take our place with God and do what he has called us to do to get on assignment. It's time to shake off snakes. And finally, friends, if you want to understand what to do when things go from bad to worse, we need to have our eyes fixed on Jesus. Eyes on the cross, heart for the loss. That was one of the models that we had when we first started vision. The next thing that happened in this chapter was amazing. The poison did not harm Paul, and instead it, in fact, help him. Do you know that those assignments of the enemy that are sent against you, not only will they not harm you if you give them over to the Lord, they will in fact help you. The thing that the enemy wants to destroy you with is the thing that God is going to elevate you with. Do you know that the scripture says that all things, 
work together for the good of those who love God and call according to his purpose. Look at the story of Joseph. My goodness, his hater brothers, like, were so jelly of him that they threw him in the pit, and then they sold him into slavery, and then went from bad to worse, and then he went and was a slave, and then was falsely accused of rape, and then thrown into prison. But it was from prison that he went to the palace. Friends, those things that the enemy sends against you can be the very things that God will use to elevate you if and only if you continue to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Your eyes fixed on Jesus. Sometimes when you feel like you're in depression or things are just going so bad, God will use you and what you're going through to help somebody else. Doesn't the scripture say with the same compassion that you received, you can now give out to others? Now the island, the, the people from Malta, the island of Malta, VeggieTales should really do a one on the island of Malta. I can see them all like dressed up like shakes and stuff, like milkshakes and malts. Yes, yes, I totally just pictured it. I'm sorry, I had to let you into my brain for a second. Mm-hmm, yeah, that would be good. And so they went from, oh, this guy's the devil to, woo, he's like a god. Friends, God wants to elevate you, but we have to keep our eyes fixed on him. We can't give up. And when we go through things, we need to know that Christ is right there with us. He's there in the storm. He's there as we're swimming to sh- uh, swimming, swimming, swimming to shore. <laughs> he is there when we're crying alone by ourselves at night. He is there when we don't have the words to say. He is there. And so fix your eyes on him, the author, the author and perfecter or finisher of your faith. You can't be perfect on your own, friends. Only Christ can be perfect, but you can let that perfect into you. That's Jesus. He is the author. That means he wrote your story. He wrote your story. There's a chapter in heaven called Joy Hester, y'all. Woo! You don't want to read the Joy Thomas part. It gets better when it turns to Joy, Joy Hester. <laughs> Not that I didn't have a great childhood, but I'm talking about my teenage years. Listen. Oh, there, was a couple, there was a couple good chapters in, in, in Joy Thomas, too. They did call me God woman at 13 before I backslid. <laughs> Listen, y'all. There's a story in heaven with your name on it. He is the author and perfecter of your faith. Let him finish that work. Keep your eyes on him. Don't give up. This is what Philippians says. I'm going to close with this. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. It says, brothers, I do not consider that I have already made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God wants to open doors that you can use your biggest storms in your life that people will come to know you. Would you stand up with me, friends? We're going to pray. We're going to close out in prayer. We're going to close out in prayer. God is good. Is he good? Do you feel encouraged of what to do when things go from bad to worse in your life? I'm I'm encouraged. Where you are, there you are. Be present, friends. Be present. Make the most of every opportunity. Remain faithful. Shake off those snakes and fix your eyes. Your eyes may be fixed on Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the men and women in this house today, for those who are tuning in, for those who couldn't come today. God, I thank you for our body, imperfect people who serve a perfect God, people who are going through it in 2020. God, we need you. But God, I believe some of the greatest fruit of your church is going to come out of this year because of the sufferings that we're enduring. Suffering is never for nothing. There is purpose in our pain, and we trust you, God. God, I pray right now that there would be an inward commitment of your sons and daughters, even in this house. God, I pray for young people right now that you would stir their fire, Lord God. Stir their fire, Lord Jesus. Let them know that you are the God who sees them and loves them and that every snake that's sent against them, that they have authority and power through you to shake it off. God, that if they would remain faithful, there are still greater days ahead of them in you, that you give them refreshing 
And God, we pray. I pray for the Church of America right now, Lord God. Help us not lose our heart. There's studies and statistics that say that the Church of America is dying, that people are not coming back to church. But I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And God, I believe for the greatest revival America's ever seen, Lord God, that you would start with us, that you would start with young people, that you would start with people who have been serving you for years that just need the fire stoked again, Lord. God, things have been bad. Things have been hard. But God, you are still God and you are still good and we still trust you with our life. God, I pray for those who have been going through so many hardships. You know who they are. You know what they're suffering. You know what they've been enduring. God, would you show them right now that you love them, that you have not given up on them, that you care for them. Let's just take a quiet time right now. And would you just, in your own words, in your mind, or if you want to whisper out loud, would you just speak to the Lord right now where you're at? Ask them to come in that place that's so hard that you're struggling with right now. God, come into my anxiety, Lord. I need you there. Come into my fear. Whatever it is, come into it. Lean into God. Father, we lean into you. We lean into you. We thank you. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. If you need some one-on-one prayer, I'll be glad to pray with you once I put my mask on. Bless you. I love you and I appreciate you.